Our next panel, panel is our, uh, some practitioners in the field, our superintendents. So I'm not going to introduce. You guys go ahead um, and get started. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Ebell, and I serve as deputy superintendent for the Clear Creek Independent School District. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share our story with you. Uh, Clear Creek ISD, if you're not familiar with our school district, is located 29 miles south of the Houston uh, metro area. And we are home to 41,000 plus students, 5,000 employees at 44 campuses and 13 of which qualify for Title I support. And we're also proud to be uh, the home of NASA's Johnson Space Center. We're very blessed to have a richly diverse student population. And as a school district, we believe that respect for diversity really strengthens our community. So in 2013, our community supported a $367 million bond issue to replace or renovate aging school buildings, improve infrastructure, and invest in learning technology. For learning technology, we enhanced our wireless infrastructure in all facilities, and we purchased a mobile device, either a laptop or a tablet, for all students in grades 4 through 12, which effectively is about 30,000 devices that we put in the hands of our students. This particular initiative for mobile technology we refer to as Latitude to Learn. Now, the focus of Latitude to Learn is on providing students access for learning at any time, any place, and at any pace. Uh, unique to this program is students in grades 6 through 12 are issued the mobile device and they're able to take these devices home. Now included in Latitude to Learn is a very deep commitment to student privacy and protection. In fact, as we were planning for this initiative, we convened a parent advisory committee and some of the key priorities or the, one of the key priorities for our initiative from the parent's perspective was focusing on privacy and protecting students while they're online for, from harmful content. So all, because of that, all of our devices that our students are issued are routed through our internet filters, whether they're at school or whether they're at home. And so that's a key component that we've taken very seriously. And at the same time, as we've learned through this process, we also are moving away from certain search engines and uh, related platforms that we believe have privacy concerns related to tracking and targeted advertisements of students. <clears throat> With Latitude to Learn came the expectation also that we lighten students' backpacks and move away from traditional textbooks and transition to digital resources. We've stayed true to that expectation and we've now gone through two textbook adoption cycles and we've adopted more electronic textbooks than um, previous. And, but we've stayed uh, focused on working with traditional textbook publishers. Today we have 83 electronic textbook titles from 12 publishers in use. Specifically, we've purchased classroom sets of traditional textbooks and then provided students electronic versions of the selected textbooks. Now, back to the pu traditional textbook publishers, we've chosen to purchase directly from the textbook publishers, traditional textbook publishers, with titles that are included on the conforming list because we want to ensure that only TEKS-based, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills-based instructional resources are used in our skills. And that's been an emphasis for us. And so we've stayed away from what's commonly referred to as open source materials. We have a significant, uh, pardon me, we've saved a significant amount of our instructional materials allotment funds by adopting electronic textbooks. We estimate that if we had purchased traditional textbooks for each student as we had in the past, we would have spent an additional $5 million. This would have effectively depleted our instructional materials allotment. Please keep in mind, however, we would not have switched to electronic textbooks had we not invested $15 million in our computer tablets uh, for the large majority of our students. It's important that I add that we've now been through two textbook adoption cycles with IMA. In our first IMA adoption cycle, we saved an estimated $4 million through the selection of electronic textbooks. In the second adoption cycle, that savings was reduced to $1 million because publishers eliminated, many publishers eliminated much of the cost differential between traditional textbooks and electronic versions. While we believe selecting electronic textbooks was a right step for our students, it has been a, a very labor intensive and a very difficult change for our families. To be able to make the move to electronic textbooks, we had our computer programmers develop a specific portal for our students to access their textbooks. So the unique feature of this portal, as it was originally designed, was a feed from our student information system so that students with one click could see their, uh, their schedule and see the list of textbooks, electronic materials that they could access. 
I would like to pause here for a moment and point out that I believe that Clear Creek ISD is very fortunate in the fact that we actually have computer programmers on staff to develop a textbook portal. We believe that the large majority of smaller school districts in the state don't have such personnel to carry out and create such a portal. In many districts, assigning individual student logins for textbooks it would be a, a task that's relegated to individual classroom teachers and students would have to master the login and accessing with very little support for multiple textbooks. The next point I want to emphasize is the extreme challenges we've had in acquiring logins for electronic materials from our textbook publishers. Working with a variety of publishers, we found very little consistency in how students are expected to access electronic textbooks. In some cases, textbook publishers provided a single district access code to be used by literally thousands of students. This was a very simple approach that worked well but our most challenging and most common experience has been the expectations that students have a unique ID and access code. This last approach is sometimes as complex as completing an online financial transaction and has been highly frustrating to parents and students alike. One publisher in particular requires a username, password, and an initial 16 character alphanumeric code to gain access to their site. I share this information with you today in hopes that all textbook publishers move to a common platform to access electronic materials. Such an approach is referred to as Learning Tools Interoperability, or LTI. LTI is a rapidly growing K-20 sign-on standard for accessing web-based resources. LTI, however, is a minimum standard to help with interoperability. We need a system that will enable seamless integration of electronic textbooks or resources in most learning management systems. Late last week, I learned that one publisher intended to make LTI available on five of our current text, textbook titles, electronic textbooks. We hope that all publishers follow suit and make LTI available on all titles at no additional cost. As I've shared, our staff members have spent countless hours trying to make a wide variety of resources easily accessible and useful for our students. In preparation for today's testimony, I spoke with one staff member and asked how much time she would estimate that she spent on working with publishers gaining access information and over a two-year period she estimates that she spent a thousand hours in addition to her regular responsibilities. So I want to emphasize today that we have struggled making electronic textbooks fit the needs for our students. We believe that most publishers in fact were not ready for this electronic shift for electronic materials and we found in our work with parents and families that if these re electronic resources are not easy to access then students and their parents are likely to abandon the resources and demand a traditional textbook. A secondary issue we've experienced deals with availability. As you well know, public schools are very time-bound places. Our parents expect that when school started for us on August 24th that all learning materials would be accessible. So this is a sense of urgency that in the public schools we always live in. Uh, we found that textbook publishers unfortunately do not share our same sense of urgency and time-bound. We, want, we went for two weeks right up to Labor Day with limited or no access to several of our major textbook publisher websites for our electronic materials. I would go so far to say that we have some parents who in fact would like to access to their students materials even before school starts. Textbook publishers need to recognize this challenge and adapt to meet student and parent needs. So we respectfully request that textbook publishers use a common platform at a minimum and that they use learning tools and interoperability so that students, teachers, and parents can much more easily access the learning tools paid for by our taxpayers. These minimum standards should not come at an extra cost and should be expected for all students in Texas. We also request that publishers embrace the time in which students need to access learning materials and make these resources available. So as I close today, I want to draw the focus of my comments to what ultimately this is all about. And ultimately it's learning and the success of each student in our Texas public schools. So when we talk about textbooks or computers or learning management systems, we're really talking about tools to meet learning needs. I have people in my own community who frequently ask me if this investment tech in technology is making a difference in the learning in our schools. And in response to that question, I point to one of our elementary schools that qualifies for Title I assistance but has made a profound investment in teacher training and working closely with the community and has seen significant performance increases in our students, not only on the state assessment, but our own assessments as well. And so I would say the utilization of these tools, we would say from our own experience, that the utilization of learning technology tools does in fact boost student achievement, but it's only done in partnership with uh, the various vendors that we work with. 
So we need systems and we need support uh, in enhancing systems and expectations so that all students have resources they need to be successful. Thank you. Fantastic. Love Smith. Hello, yes, I'm Deanna Love Smith from Belton ISD. I'm just he's got a PowerPoint. They, they were supposed to give them to you if there were any. Okay. I'm the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction in Belton ISD. And Belton ISD is located just about 60 miles north of here. We have almost 11,000 students now, and we are considered a fast growth district. Over the last five years, we implemented a one to one in digital learning in our secondary campuses. We started out in 2011 with approximately 849 devices and we have now grown to a little over 5,600. But it hasn't stopped at our secondary campuses. At our elementary le levels, we've also implemented a one to three device um, through technology lending grants that have been offered through TEA, through our PTAs and our beef education. And today I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our story over the last five years in hopes of helping you all look at your central question, which is what do you do for the next five years for our students? We believe that it really starts with our vision and that vision for our district and I know for the state is, is the vision for our students in the state to excel in tomorrow's world. We have focused on digital learning um, through collaboration, creativity, communication, which is inherent in, in the digital learning concepts. Those are skills that are often not measured on our state assessments but are critical for our students to success in tomorrow's world. For the last five years, we focused in our district on the visionary planning that is required for our digital learning, much like you're looking at today. The organization, how to get the devices out, the apps, work with the publishers, as my colleague just stated, in getting our digital learning opportunities available to students. The economic management, and we thank you um, for continued flexibility with the use of our IMA funds and also the E-rate to support this and then to continually motivate. But where it really has started for us is our focus on teaching and learning. We have provided opportunities through digital learning for our students to have options to Skype in with people from other states to learn, to share our knowledge, um, the ability to access information just outside of a, of a textbook that is ever changing, the customization for our students of all different levels, from our students that struggle with disabilities to our students that are gifted and providing personalization through digital resources. But it's not digital all the time. We've incorporated project-based learning skills and we continue to rely on the support of effective teachers because they are the key to bridging our digital use with our students. A big focus for us over the last five years in Belton ISD has been our curriculum development, and it all begins with our TEKS. We continue to focus on the TEKS that are established to ensure that we are staying with those as we develop our iTunes U courses for students, and then we have also adopted textbooks, both classroom and then digital. We continually review and revise those with our teachers to ensure that we are providing curriculum that is aligned. But with the digital learning and with the textbooks, also we've entered into the world of apps, and those apps are ever-growing. And that in and of itself is something that must be managed. We've created vetting processes in our district so that when teachers find apps that they like to use, we, are, we can ensure that they are aligned with the TEKS. We can ensure the management of the cost variation, and then just how to implement all those tech um, apps to our students. It's the quality, not the quantity that we're looking for in that. Um, we have implemented online learning management systems that ally, um, allow our parents through their own access into our um, individual child's records to look at only what their child is doing, their child's assignments, um, access notes. We use all of this at our secondary level and um, it allows for transparent learning for what's happening in our classroom. We also believe it's um, encouraging our students and preparing them for higher ed, where many of our students will use these devices once they enter college. We've spent a tremendous amount of time on ongoing professional development. Again, it's not just about the devices, but changing the learning for our teachers with a large focus on the SAMR model and um, targeted PD for our teachers and coaching. We've also included things like digital cafes where teachers can just share what they're learning. 
in the classroom. We, we are um, required, uh, we have our accountability system with ourselves to make sure that this is impacting change. We have two schools that have been recognized as Apple Distinguished Schools. We have Google, Google Educators. And in a recent Bright Bite survey where over 440 Texas school districts participated, we found ourselves coming in third. So we're proud of all of the different aspects that have brought us to today. And those are the areas we think need to be looked at, the teaching and learning, the professional development. We, when we look at our, our implementation, we look at how it's being utilized in the classroom. We've addressed, like you all are looking at today, the accessibility of our students. And we currently know that in our district, 90% of our students report accessibility to Wi-Fi at home. So we're looking for that 10%. And what we can do to ensure through partnerships with our community, how we can ensure that access for them when they leave our doors. We've also looked at the access on our own campuses. We look at the foundational skills and then the environment of learning to support that we have also taken a focus not only on the professional development but our learning facilities and as we build new buildings digital learning is at the forefront for us including open spaces collaboration spaces because we are going beyond just the device but to look at the collaboration skills that are required of our students when using these devices We've come a long way in five years, but we also have that next level of work. We have found that in addition to the student devices is the teacher replacement cycle. Our teachers must have the tools and resources that are needed to provide education when we believe them to be the center of our classrooms. We are looking at what's next for elementary. We focused a lot on our secondary learning, but what's next uh, for our elementary? We continue today in, to stay in touch with the digital leaders in our community, the Google, the Apple, to see what they're pushing out in their companies. We are developing our courses in iTunes U aligns to our TEKS, but we are maintaining a focus of the four C's the collaboration, the creativity, the communication, and the critical thinking, those are the pieces that we believe come behind digital learning. It's not just putting a kid in front of a device and letting them stare at it all day, but it's getting those global skills that are essential for us. We will continue to focus on digital citizenship, not only for our teachers, but our, or not only for our students, but for our teachers, our surveys show Everyone needs to be educated on digital learning uh, citizenship and what's involved with that, and that's a big focus for us. And then we'll continue to focus on professional development for our teachers. We believe they are the cornerstone of digital learning for us and that they maintain our focus. And that's just kind of our story over the last five years. All right, Randy. <clears throat> I'm Randy Muchicamba. I'm superintendent at New Braunfels Independent School District, and uh, we are located 45 miles. Uh, put a mic, uh, make sure. Yeah. Thank you. Start over with that. I am Randy Muchicamba. I'm superintendent at New Braunfels Independent School District. We are located 45 miles south of Austin on I-35, so between here and San Antonio. We are a district of 8,438 students. Um, we have one high school, eight elementaries, two new elementaries to be built from a successful bond election just a couple of weeks ago. Um, a ninth grade center, which is a stepping stone between the one high school and the second high school. Um, and it was with that ninth grade center that uh, we began the transition to one-to-one uh, -one digital learning for all students uh, in 2010 with a bond election. Uh, that ninth grade center gave us an opportunity to pilot the technology with one grade level of students. Um, it gets a little complicated when you have students taking multiple levels of classes at the high school all at the same time if they don't all have the technology. Uh, since that time period, we have implemented one-to-one -one technology uh, 9 through 12 in the second year and uh, this last year 6 through 12 uh, and current year we're 4th 
through 12th grade uh, with plans to go one to one K through 12 by 2017 when we open the two elementary schools. Uh, the question about what should Texas be doing. Uh, school transformation is not about the technology. I've spent some time talking about the technology. Technology is simply a tool that can greatly enhance enhance um, school transformation. This is a little complicated. Um, we found that equal access to technology has left the ability to level the playing foot field for all students. Uh, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. Uh, when the algebra curriculum several years ago picked up the requirement for graphing calculators to be provided to all students and state accountability uh, required those students to have access to the calculators um, on the test. Uh, we at New Braunfels ISD, like a lot of districts, bought classroom sets of graphing calculators. And we asked ourselves the question, how can those students who cannot afford their own calculator uh, compete with kids whose parents buy them one who have 24-7 access? And so the one-to-one -one was very important to us to make sure that every student had access to the technology. Uh, at that point in time, we began working with one of the graphing calculator companies, uh, encouraging them to provide an app, a graphing calculator app, uh, which they have done and we're very excited about and especially excited about the, uh, the uh, new opportunity to u utilize, pardon me, that app on the state assessment. Now our kids have 24-7 access to the graphing calculator, every one of them, and the same graphing calculator that they'll be using on the test. Uh, at MBISD, <coughs> school transformation is about project-based learning. Uh, we're investing a lot of time uh, training our teachers, doing staff development. Uh, we had a large group who went through uh, multi-day training this year in project-based learning. We have uh, continuing ed for them this school year. We're introducing it to our cohort two, uh, which will do intense training in the summer of 2016. Uh, and we expect to have all staff uh, trained very intensely in project-based learning by the summer of 2017, uh, again at the time that we opened the two new elementary schools. Uh, we're very focused on applying the TEKS that are being learned. Uh, I will share with you my concern about the accountability system and state assessment is that we focus on still a lot of memorization and not deep level application. Um, we want to develop the criti critical thinking skills that have been discussed already and enhancing students ability to collaborate uh, because that is one area that employers say is very critical for the graduates of the future. Uh, I threw farmer math in here because uh, in my own experience, I was a dis economically disadvantaged child uh, in school, worked 40 hours a week, pretty much from fifth grade all the way through my senior year. I grew up on a farm, and I can remember as a child uh, between probably first grade and, and eighth grade driving tractors and doing a lot of work on the farm um, and riding on the back of an implement that my dad had built in his shop that to spray weeds and, and defoliate cotton, <coughs> holding a mason jar underneath a sprayer to measure the amount of liquid being sprayed out of each nozzle. And so we traded the nozzles out because if, if you study the physics part of it, uh, each nozzle, the farther it is from the pump, the less chemical is sprayed. So you have to size the nozzles. Um, when I started in high school and took an algebra class and asked, why do I need to know these things, uh, the answer became, because we told you to, now be quiet and do this. So, uh, you know, that applied learning was very important to me, and, and my career as a uh, career and technology teacher uh, was very important because I was teaching kids skills that they could apply and that they could graduate from high school and, and apply in a job right out of high school. Um, 
we would think that we need to um, allow and encourage districts to let teachers create content. Uh, we are one of the biggest users, if not the biggest high school or public school user of iTunes U uh, that exists. Our teachers are very creative in creating that content. Uh, we work very close, closely with TASA, who also is creating content for Texas teachers to use in the classroom. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that a lot of the people who work for textbook companies are former educators. They know where the experience is and they hire that experience. We want to utilize the experience while they're working for us. Um, what we've also found is that creating content is probably the number one best way for teachers to understand what project-based learning is because they work together in groups to create the content. Um, we have offered our teachers two opportunities. One is to pay them uh, additional salary during the summer to create content. The second is to allow them to work together collaboratively during the school year, during the school day with subs uh, in their classrooms to create content. And our teachers choose working collaboratively together uh, during the school year over additional opportunities to rate to make money during the summer and we all know teachers could use the extra funding um, <clears throat> our great teachers have always created project-based learning in the classroom as an administrator I've observed teachers in the classroom since 1987 a very young principal and uh, have been amazed at the way some teachers take that project-based learning and we're trying to make that a hundred percent in every classroom what else should we be doing? Um, it would be awesome if we could allow districts to utilize IMA money to pay teachers to create content. I don't know if that's an option, uh, but again, we want to provide the monetary incentives for those teachers to be involved in that. And, and as I just shared with you, the collaboration piece is very important to them, and they would choose that over monetary anytime. Uh, we do budget for that in our local budget to be able to make it happen. Uh, creating our content allows us also to align the, the TEKS-based instruction, and we are 100% TEKS, uh, with the local values of our individual community. There are great OER resources that exist for curriculum development, and uh, the ones we use predominantly, are, as I said, are Apple iTunes U. Uh, and also iBook author. We have created a position in our district who is an iBook author, uh, electronic textbook expert, and uh, he works in, in not only creating content, uh, but teaching teachers how to create content. Uh, blended learning, online courses, you know, what can we do different? When we look at schools and the way they're designed today, we focus on 175 school years or 7,600 minutes now. Uh, and I challenge you that, that students learn at different paces. We've always known that. It's always been a challenge for teachers in the classroom, uh, especially when the equity to access a technology did not exist uh, because our teachers spent lots of time trying to bring those kids who did not have resources prior to, to school up to speed. Uh, but uh, one thing that we do allow is students who are behind credits to uh, do online credit work, to credit recovery while they continue in their high school career. Uh, what we would like to see more flexibility in is the ability to, of any student to be able to take online courses as long as that they cover all the teaks and their high quality uh, content courses and remove the, the restraint of 175 days or 7,600 minutes. Um, also, uh, one of the things that we're pursuing is the um, uh, text vision and uh, the limitation now on text vision is that uh, we can have our students only taking, uh, I believe, three courses text vision. The rest have to be online, uh, have to be in the classroom. And, uh, you know, with that in mind, uh, as we talk about the things such as school choice, one of the things that we would like an opportunity as public schools is to become that school of choice uh, for 
all students. And uh, we think that's a way that we can compete. There are, are lots of reasons that parents uh, choose not to put their children in public schools. However, a lot of those uh, students wish to come back and, and participate in career and technology classes and athletic programs and the like. And uh, if we could regain those students uh, competitively through online courses to let them do the things that, that they're inclined to do at home, it would make us uh, competitive in that school choice race. Uh, we also believe that the school choice or education in general, that we need to bring all stakeholders together. We are having conversation in our district with parents who homeschool and with parents who send their kids to private school, and we're asking what are the reasons those children are going there? What is it that we're not providing? What can we do better? Uh, and as we look to the children, all of the children of the state of Texas, I think it's important to bring all those stakeholders together at the table, and I think that's an area that, for the most part, most stakeholders have been unwilling to do. Uh, want to talk a little bit about cost drivers and... Um, <clears throat> I, I think we'll have to leave. I, okay. I just looked through your slides there. You've got some great slides with a lot of good detail, but we got to kind of keep moving on and then we'll get to the Q&A section. Okay, great. No problem. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Scott Murray and I'm the superintendent of Spring Branch ISD and it's a pleasure to be here this morning and I appreciate the opportunity to share. So I was 20 years old and entered the middle school classroom and I was about nine weeks into my career and the principal said, you know, Scott, it's, it's time to do your evaluation and I'm going to come to your classroom tomorrow and I'm going to sit in the back of the room and I'm going to take a few notes and then we'll talk about it afterwards and so that day of uh, uh, that day occurred and of course I was a nervous wreck uh, planned in my mind what I thought was an incredible lesson for the principal to come in and see and she walked in just as, as she had stated and she sat in the back of the room and she wrote and she wrote and she wrote and left after about 30 minutes. And right before she left, she stopped and said, Scott, I need to see you in my office at the end of the day. <laughs> of course, terror came over me. I have no idea what happened um, from that point forward, but I did make my way to the office and hopefully my kids made it home safely. I have not gotten the call that they didn't. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I sat in her office and she began to talk about what she had experienced that day. And, and just as a good principal does, she let me know those things that as a teacher, I had done really well. And I was breathing. And then she said, Scott, there are a few things that you need to work on. And we walked through those things in my, in my lesson that day in which needed a little bit of attention. But it was what happened at the end of that conversation that really drives my conversation with you today. And she asked me, she gave me two statements. She said, Scott, I want you to tell me the name of every single student in your class today. And I said, really? And she said, yes, name them. And so I had 32 students that period, and I named all 32. And she said, now I want you to tell me exactly what each of those children learned today in your classroom. And that was the stumper. I couldn't do it. As a teacher, I thought I had taught a great lesson. But the real question is, what did your students learn today? And as the teacher, I couldn't answer that question. I mean, back in 1988, it was difficult as a teacher in one room to answer that question every day about what my students learned. And she told me, she said, Scott, your responsibility as a teacher is that every single day you have to create an experience in which every child learns. And you've got to verify that they do that. And in 1988, that was very difficult to do. But fast forward today, and we have powerful opportunities to ensure that every day, every child has a learning experience. Let me tell you about Smith Middle School. Middle school of 900 students, 95% of these kids are economically disadvantaged. Mathematically, they are a year and a half behind their peers. And so as a sixth grader enters this school, they're actually mathematically, the average child is at a four, fourth grade, um, fourth month level. That's a problem. We cannot attack that academic problem of those children the same way that we have always attacked the academic problems of children. And so Smith Middle School decided to do something very different. They decided that it is very important that every single day we not only teach these children, but we know exactly what they're learning. And so at Smith Middle School, we married incredible technology with powerful teachers and created some great results for children. So every day, 150 students walked into this really large room with seven teachers working together as a team. 
Yes, not one teacher in a space, but seven teachers working together as a team. And when the children walked in, they found their name on this large display board, much like when you go to the airport, you find your flight and your gate number. These children found their name and they found their location on which, in which they were to begin their academic experience in math that particular day. When they got to one of six different groups, they discovered as they looked around that they were grouped in one of two ways. These children were grouped based upon what they needed to learn that day, and they were based, grouped based upon how they learned best, because we knew the learning styles of those children, and we also knew exactly which mathematics standards those children needed to learn that particular day. We knew that some kids were kinesthetic learners, and so we grouped them in an area in which they could actually touch and feel mathematics. We knew that some children were moving at a pace so rapid that we didn't want to stand in their way. Because this large group of kids, mathematically, they actually ranged from third grade to 10th grade mathematically. That was the actual range of this group of students, third grade to 10th grade. But yet we were funneling them into a middle school of sixth grade through eighth graders. Interesting. So we grouped kids. Again, we put some of our children with a live virtual tutor. We sat them in front of an individual with headphones and a microphone who knew specifically the academic needs of that child. They knew how they learned best, and they provided some one-on-one -on -one attention for some of those children. We grouped children with an adaptive math application, uh, some very powerful and impressive software that knew exactly where a child was, could take them along that mathematical journey. Six different opportunities. At the end of 25 minutes, those kids stood up. They found their name on that big board again, and they moved to another location. Three times every day in mathematics, those children were grouped based upon what they needed to learn. We didn't teach them things that they already knew, and they were grouped based upon how they learn best. And the results, well, at the end of the year, the average child in that space grew 20% faster than his or her peers across the country as measured by a nationally normed assessment. It gets better though. I said 95% of those children were economically disadvantaged. That group of children grew 30% faster than their peers across the country. But the most exciting statistic was that our special ed population grew 119% faster than their peers across the country. And why? It's because we married really great teachers with powerful tools of technology, and we personalized it for every single child in that classroom. Every teacher knew every day what a child was learning. And we're able to do that in this year, 2015, because we have really powerful tools of technology that enable really great teachers to do great work with children. And so some thoughts today that can help us continue to do that really great work for children across this great state in which we live. As a superintendent, I firmly believe there is no one best solution for children. As we think about that traditional model of a textbook that drives every child from chapter one to chapter two to chapter three, that may work for some, but it does not work for most. And how do we know that? Well, we can look at the academic results of our schools today across the state, and we see that that traditional model of thinking that everyone learns the same way, that is broken. Technology allows us to think differently about what we provide for children. So as a superintendent, I know that there is not one best solution for children. There are many best solutions for our children. And so we must encourage our technology companies and our publishers that are here today to help us think differently about the work that we do with our children. As a superintendent, I am no longer interested in buying one textbook or one online subscription for all of my children. That is no longer the model that works for kids. So I need to encourage our textbook companies and other vendors who provide digital resources to schools to think differently about resources that meet individual student learning needs. Tools that empower teachers to do really great work on behalf of children. Tools that allow the teacher to know at the end of the day that children have actually learned something. Specifically, they learned the standard that that teacher hoped to accomplish or teach that particular day in that class. As a superintendent, I need our textbook vendors and other publishers to think about being open and not rigid with how they create their content 
open source content, content that allows me as the superintendent or allows a principal or a teacher to pick and choose content that is appropriate for the children that they serve every day, content that contains powerful learning objects for children, powerful learning objects for teachers. I need teachers to be empowered to make really smart choices on behalf of their children and not locked into a six or seven or eight year subscription to something that may or may not work. That's clearly problematic for the children that we serve today, as evidenced by data that we continue to generate in our own state. I need publishers, I need textbook companies, I need vendors to create algorithms and incorporate powerful algorithms that take student data and keep it confidential, but use it to benefit the student in the short term and in the long term. Those algorithms that allow teachers to do what they do best, and that is teach and not have to grade or assess on a constant and continual basis, but they can simply look at the outcomes of those assessments and make wise academic choices for children. Algorithms that also empower children to make their own decisions about their own learning. I need technology that enables learning, technology that empowers educators and children to do really great work, technology that allows children to be self-advocates so that they can guide their own learning process, and I need technology that provides our teachers and children with tremendous agility so that on the fly we can make choices that benefit our children. In Spring Branch ISD, this, we recognize that this legislature this year passed a very exciting opportunity in House Bill 1842 called Districts of Innovation. It allows us as a system to think very different about the type of academic experience that we provide for children. It allows us to think differently about time. It allows us to recognize that kids move at their own pace and rate of speed through curriculum. So I need digital resources that allow us to be empowered by our own House Bill 1842 and the concept of districts of innovation. I need technology that in empowers the teacher and the student to finally do what is best for them. And so at the end of the day, when the principal asks the teacher that question, what did your students learn today? By name, every teacher in every classroom across Spring Branch and every district in Texas can say, I know specifically what my children learned today, and then the results of that will be increased student achievement for the students across not only Spring Branch, but across our state. And that is the hope, and that is the dream of the superintendent of Spring Branch ISD. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I look forward to the um, opportunity to visit with you today. I want to thank you for, for inviting me to uh, speak with you. Uh, I'm Karen Room, Superintendent in Northwest ISD, and that is a district in the North Fort Worth area, and uh, it's not directional in another central city in Texas. Uh, I've titled this Instructional Materials Matter, uh, and talking about our, our goal in educating our kids in a digital generation. And I'd like to start with stepping back for just a moment and talking about, pardon me, the value of the resources to our kids. Instructional materials matter significantly as they're learning, not only as a ubiquitous digital platform in their world, but they're finding it replicated and are asking for it to be rec replicated in their classrooms. Through technology, kids have access to, to many, many resources. Our instructional materials are a part of that. By leveraging the instructional materials and the resources that our kids have in digital platforms, we provide many, many more opportunities for them to be active participants in their learning, to be engaged in that learning, to problem solve, to be critical thinkers. These are all, of course, you'll see photographs of students within our system. Uh, and what you'll note is that their engagement is extremely high when they have control, when they have an opportunity to have a direction with their learning. And I'm sharing this particular 
question with you because it's a question I ask our students consistently. I meet with secondary students in small groups throughout the year uh, at each of our, our uh, middle schools and high schools. I sit down and have an informal chat with them. And I ask them, what are we doing that we can do better? What do you need in your classrooms? What do you wish you had? And how can we take better advantage of the resources that are available to you and the things we need to be thinking about for your future? The kids are very open. And if you've sat down with a group of middle school students, our high school students, they will tell you when you ask. They live in a world where their digital resources are ubiquitous. They're anywhere. Now, they're typically in their hip pocket or in, you know, because it's, the, it's their, <clears throat> their smartphone in the palm of their hand. And they bring those into the classroom as valuable tools. They want their work, they want their instructional materials to be interactive, personalized. And, and I'll describe that for you. The kids tell me that uh, they're looking at some of their, their materials that are textbooks, their, you know, their digital adoptions, and, and they're being somewhat dismissive, and they're saying, you know, they're a little more than PDFs. They're just PDFs. I can just, you know, look at that. I want something that allows me to annotate. I want to underline. I want to highlight. I want to make a note. I want to be able to attach a link to it. I want to be able to see something when I do it. I want to be able to switch to my journal and make some comments about it and come back to that page. I want to interact with my materials. They do it in every other aspect of their world. <clears throat> and while I'm on the subject, I'll just simply say that when we go back and look at some of our materials, those that were adopted, say a math adoption for 6 through 12 in 2007-8, those digital resources are dated by now, and the way those get updated matter to our kids. Uh, they want to be able to elevate and control that content and how they work with it. And I've already mentioned the PDF aspect of it, uh, how frustrating that is to them, uh, and the ease when logging in. Others have mentioned it today here in this panel. Uh, we provide a learning platform for our students. When they turn on their, their tablet, they arrive in their classroom, they log in to our system. They go to their, their schedule, their day. All of their class files are there, so are their digital materials. And as they work through the day, they must interact individually with each one of those digital texts. And currently, a student may have if they've got uh, six different digital texts they're going to work with, there are six different digital logins with passwords, with uh, proprietary characteristics that they must remember and meet. They want to be able to log into their day and have those resources available to them. And that's a huge point for us because we need for them to be able to do that too. It takes tremendous man hours behind the scene to manage an infrastructure with that type of digital resource in it when every one of them acts independently of the others. And so that, that's a time constraint and it's a frustration for our students. I'd like to talk about one of the things that I think are critical to us as we move forward in looking at instructional materials within digital formats. The materials should be accessible on any device. Our students have the option to bring their own device to school. They bring Macs, they bring PCs, they bring tablets, they bring iPads. They have a plethora of choices. We provide a tablet uh, for students. You know, they can use the one we provide. They can bring their own. It's not about the device, it's about the access and the interactive component of what they're doing with those instructional materials. And it's with the connection they have with their teacher as collectively they're working through that learning experience together. They're asking, they're asking specifically for a consistent access to materials where those logins are standardized. I, what we're really asking for is that we can log in once for the day 
And now we have access to our materials. We don't need to log in with the publisher and additionally on top of that. We've got access to those materials and we can use them. That, that that's standardized. Uh, access methods, and here's, and I'm not talking about login here. Now I'm talking about the interactive part of using the text itself. We have different text providers and our digital providers who work from different platforms. Uh, frequently, those platforms don't work well and play well with others. So they will be in a conflict with another one, a device the kid might have open on their, on their laptop. They've got to turn that, shut that one down, open the next one. They operate with Java, they operate with Flash, they operate with other uh, operational tools that aren't always supported and are a challenge for us in that way as well. Uh, I would suggest not that I'm your, your technical expert by any means, you need a whole group, another group of people to ha handle that part, but something that is HTML5 or higher that would operate web-based so it doesn't matter which device our students are in. It gives us flexibility, it gives a fluid flow between materials as kids are interacting with them. That's, that's what our kids are asking for. They're, they're asking that the integration to that be standard. Uh, so, uh, you know, so my suggestion is that as we look forward to future proclamations, we, we think about a standard set of uh, technical specifications for how these platforms work together. Uh, districts spend a great deal of time are resources, if the staffing capacity is not within the district, to recreate and to problem solve and to, and to troubleshoot when these things don't work well together. If there is a common platform that we use consistently in the industry when it comes to educational resources and materials, and if that were part of the proclamation itself as technical specifications of how these things can work together then it becomes much easier for districts to use those resources in a web-based platform. So, so that one is really what I'm, what I uh, am, am I doing my best to explain is a cross-platform support that it offers us the standards that that students can set up and stay that way. Uh, one point I would like to share. I think I'm going to get to it with this next, oh, this next slide. Go back to this one. Uh, I'll get to it at the second point, but, but the first point, uh, there is an understanding as we look at digital materials, the sustainability of those. I mentioned a math adoption in, in 07-08 that was implemented in 07-08. Uh, those materials, as interactive components become available, need to be updated. Consider also that the platforms that they operate in become outdated quickly. So the processing power, the actual platform they run on may need patches, it may need an update. A student should not have to stop and search for the latest update to, to flash before they can use that book that day and do it individually. I came across an article in EdTech Magazine a while back that, uh, that in their survey they had done there's, that it is reported that as much as 20 to 25 percent of class time is lost simply through the frustrations of logging in, finding the patches, getting things operating, and now we can get to work. That should be behind the scenes. You know, on the other side of complexity lives simplicity. If we can get that <clears throat> off the table for kids, then their flow becomes simpler. So we also need to think about those cost of materials as we, as proclamations, uh, adoptions age out through the life of that, of that uh, adoption. And then the unclear requirements for access methods. Oh gosh, See, staff told me, I'm going to watch you do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they knew I couldn't. <laughs> okay, Hard to so, do. so I'll just close with, with, with sharing here the idea for those materials uh, to not take the time that they take to be interactive, to be operated behind the scenes through uh, a data access protocol that allows districts to focus on what they do, 
allow our publishers to create a common platform that allows us to work with this much more simply. It would be a support to districts of, regardless of size and capacity if those solutions were standardized in our, in, within our proclamations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, members, we've got questions, so push your button if you would like to ask a question. Yes, Ms. Perez. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, thank you all so much for, uh, for coming. It really helps a lot to hear your perspectives. Um, and everybody had really great points, but uh, I have to say, Dr. Murray, thank you for coming with your wish list and being very specific about what those expectations are, because um, I'm very sure that the publishers in here heard loud and clear what it is that superintendents want, so thank you for that. Um, my question is, you know, everybody really had a strong focus on um, teaching and learning and the professional development aspect of um, utilizing the technology. And so my question is, um, I think you guys, you guys had great um, strategies for all of that. Maybe can you all share how something like that can be implemented in a property poor district? Um, because I, it's, it's great when you have a lot of resources at your disposal, but for those districts who may not have the monetary support to do what you all are doing in your districts, um, I think this may be a challenge. So if anybody has maybe ideas as to how that would work, I'd love to hear them. Might I, I'll suggest one, one aspect of it that is uh, open for, for all of us. You know, this isn't solving how do you have Wi-Fi and et cetera. Uh, but, it, but it does make the operational part possible. We use, as our student learning platform, that page kids pull up, we use Moodle, which is similar to Blackboard at the university level. It's free. It's an open software. So it's open program, rather. We use Moodle. That gives the kids everything they need when they turn on their, their laptop. Everything's loaded up in, in, on that page. We use Google Docs which uh, are web-based, so there's no charge for our kids. We, their e-portfolios are on Google Docs. We use as much of the open resources that we possibly can. So that creates less of a barrier just in how do you set the thing up and get, get kids access to it. Um, digital materials purchased through IMA with their adoption, if they support that type of a platform, then, then that's one of the many hurdles that can be assisted by using some of those materials. Something else that we did that is somewhat, I, I think, unique is that through our request for proposal process for our uh, mobile devices, we included a professional learning component with that. And so all vendors who presented their devices for our consideration, that was included with the total cost of, of ownership for those devices. So we always have included professional learning in all aspects of what we're, we're trying to do. So, so I would say leverage local talent. You know, you, you, every school has really great individuals. Sometimes it's one teacher that's doing amazing things. And so to edify that single teacher in a school environment or across schools and begin to build them and, you know, one becomes two, two becomes four, et cetera, um, that grassroots knowledge and wisdom and building that capacity can do wonderful things. And that's free. You already have that talent, just building upon what you already have. You knocked out my second. My second question was gonna was gonna be, um, you know, what pro what professional development looks like um, at your different campuses. But I think that, you know, identifying that local talent really is is a great way to utilize local resources at you know no cost. But are there any other ideas as to how um, what professional development looks like on your in your districts? in terms of utilizing technology? So what we have found is that some of our best presenters are our teachers. And because not only do they experience firsthand with what our students are doing in our schools, but then they also have the credibility among their peers for the listening capability for learning. And so I think um, with the new calendar that's come out and the flexibility in school days and how you may incorporate professional development development during the year, property poor schools and, and your schools that may not be able to afford resources outside of their um, district can you utilize those days. Thank you. It's incredibly important. Uh, about two-thirds of the districts have uh, technology directors. The rest don't have someone designated for that. So that maybe is a superintendent who's also driving the bus. I have no idea. <laughs> right. but, but, you know, it's a challenge for about a third of our districts specifically that don't have those technology directors. And I would say that, uh, you know, back 
in in the mid '90s, we uh, at La Mesa ISD implemented um, a program to put internet in every classroom. That was the time that we saw the value of the World Wide Web. Uh, we were a 4A district. We did not have a technology director. I was high school principal and then assistant superintendent. We pulled every strand of cable in the district <clears throat> ourselves. We hired one expert to train us. And after we did my high school and I became assistant superintendent, I trained students and had the students help me pull the cable. And then those students became my technicians. I, I trained three seniors every summer. Uh, and they were my technicians for the next year as seniors that worked half a day. And what a wonderful way to give those kids that background in the deep levels of IT. Uh, works very well. Just be creative. Look for ways to uh, do cost elimination. When you start to go this level with technology, copiers become almost obsolete. Take that money. Don't reallocate it somewhere else, reallocate it to your technology where our teachers are developing content and we're not spending all of the IMA that way. Uh, we are spending the IMA on the technology rather than the content. Uh, and there's some very creative ways for districts to, on, a, on a tight budget. Uh, one thing that we will not do in our district is buy technology with bond funds. It all comes out of our local budget because it has to be sustainable from now on, so great ways to do that. One, one, thing, oh, oh, sorry, one thing I would add as the principal of a high school that was project-based learning, one of the things that I learned in the last few years is that our students make excellent teachers. And when you empower high school students to drive their education through project-based learning, you can learn a lot from them. So as a teacher, we still guide them and we still ensure that the learning is centered around the TEKS. But when, it talk, when you talk about maneuvering technology, how to use it, um, we have some inherent teachers in our own classrooms with our kids, and I think they add value to where we're going with this. Mr. Bradley. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Ebel, is it Ebel? I, I, well, I'd heard the discussion from the other gentleman earlier about, you know, the graphing calculator. Well, I don't know what a graphing calculator does other than it just solves all these complex problems. I watched my son sit down with one and he, he eats calculus for breakfast and he was working it and I was just amazed that he had learned and been taught to do these sequences to find the answer. But I said, do you understand the physical relationship of what you're trying to solve? No, he was just trying to solve the problem that was in the book and he knew a sequence to do to get to the answer. So I gave him a challenge and I pulled out a slide rule. <laughs> we use those, remember those? Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, a little light went off and he got excited because he could see logarithmic relationships physically and then how math actually worked. He took it to school and that's all his class did for a week was work with that slide rule. So, it, it, you know, the technology is teaching kids sometimes just sequences to go through and the right buttons to push without them even understanding what that's it is. Question. They're, where they're good. My question, though, is one that's really important, and she's going to prod me a little bit. Privacy. The thought was, is we want these kids to have access on their PDAs or their phones, and they log in one time, and they can go anywhere and do anything that they want. As a parent, I'm worried about privacy. We have a State Department in Washington that can't keep track of emails. How are we going to protect kids with their private PDAs and their phones and their privacy? in your network when we can't do it on the federal level? Yes, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, and, and it is one of the uh, points that, had I gotten to that last slide, <laughs> I could have gotten to. The, uh, we need an answer before we do all this, do we not? With the, when a student logs into our system, they're logged into our closed system. They're logged in uh, and stay within our network. So, so the uh, materials that they are accessing are within the system itself that we have control over and maintain. Uh, however, however, I think that, that it's an issue for us to consider as we work with digital materials uh, because we do know that, that when our students log in to, uh, as they're doing now individually with publishers, they're logging in with their specific information. That information then is in the you know, repository 
of that publisher. So I, I think it's critical that we also look at, at standards for privacy sets that that are ubiquitous throughout the industry and how that student data is treated once it leaves our our control. Inside but what about our control, the security of your own that. network though? These kids are smart. Oh, they're, 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 they're going to hack and find your payroll. They're smart. You know, I just wonder about this opening it up so that they can access it on any phone that they pick up. It's not secure. Within the login of, within our system, they're secure within that system. Uh, however, you, you know, there, we see every day the issues that go along with, with privacy and security in technology. You know, we see it uh, when we watch morning news and hear about uh, ransom hackers who are pulling in people's private things and, and making, you know, charging a ransom for them. These are all issues that are real for us. They're, they're real for every industry within Okay, within real, real quick, back to the other concern that was given later. One of the gentlemen testified. He said it's all wonderful if they're wanting to use a PDA or an iPad or whatever, but in the top corner, they're also got they're checking their, their Facebook items and they're checking their tweets and they're checking, you know, how do you control that? How do you control sending answers to each other? How do you, I mean, just the security issue for testing when everybody's got their own little PDA and they can tweet back and forth to each other. I think we, we could spend all day working on control and we will, there will always be a student. But it's an important issue. No, absolutely. But there will always be a situation in which someone overcomes the controls that we put in place. So it's really thinking differently about empowering students to be wise decision makers. Um, and so They're not. Part, the kids. No, They're I, stupid. I, 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 absolutely. When it comes but, to that. But the reality is if we don't they equip our mistakes. kids with being how, how to be smart consumers on the web um, with a, a high level of digital citizenship and personal responsibility, then we fail our children. Um, I, I, Come on. Now, now agree with me your dad didn't get smart until you turned 35 right sure okay. <laughs> but th but the reality is uh, you know as, as a child I had opportunities to 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 try and to uh, to experience failure and and so you know kudos to my parents for giving me those opportunities um, but but today I think w with our children we have to equip them with the ability to make really smart choices and shame on us if we don't do that um, so yes there are controls and systems that we have to put in place but they they are not ever going to be 100 percent foolproof there will always be someone smarter than us and so but equipping our kid with the ability to make really smart choices on their own and being a good citizen both off the web and on the web is really the smartest thing that we can do as educators that's personal responsibility okay. uh, mr cortez I, i'm going to let you go ahead and yeah. do your one more question and then we're going to move on I think uh, my question was answered between both of your all's comments. Okay, but great. I will add, uh, if it be okay, Madam Chair, if, if all the presenters, I, I know we're getting some worksheets, but if we can get their contact oh, information. Oh, we will, yeah. I, maybe will. throughout the course of the rest of this week, I may have a question. And Absolutely. No, we're going to have uh, access I'm to all the PowerPoints. and each of you if I have a specific question. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but you can't you share guys. that out with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of privacy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, next up, Brendan. Oh, question, question. 